Hello, and welcome to The Sword of Good, written by Eliezer Yudkowsky, read by Ineash Brodsky. Part 1 Captain Selina, late of the pirate ship Nemesis, quietly extended the very tip of her blade around the corner, staring at the tiny reflection on the metal. At once, but silently, she pulled back the sword, and with her other hand made a complex gesture. The translation spell told Hiru that the hand signs meant, Orcs, seven. Dolph looked at Hiru. My prince, the wizard signed, do not waste yourself against mundane opponents. Do not draw the sword of good as yet. Leave these to Selina. Hiru's mouth was very dry. He didn't know if the translation spell could understand the difference between wanting to talk and wanting to make gestures, and so Hiru simply nodded. Not for the first time, the thought occurred to Hiru that if he'd actually known he was going to be transported into a magical universe, informed he was the long-lost heir to the Throne of Bronze, handed the legendary Sword of Good, and told to fight evil, he would have spent less time reading fantasy novels. Joined the army, maybe taken fencing lessons at least. If there was one thing that didn't prepare you for fantasy real life, it was sitting at home reading fantasy fiction. Dolph and Selina were looking at Hiru as if waiting for something more. Oh, that's right. I'm the prince. Hiru raised a finger and pointed it around the corner, trying to indicate that they should go ahead. With a sudden burst of motion, Selina plunged around the corner, Dolph following hard on her heels, and Hiru, startled and hardly thinking, moving after. There was a hissing sound as the seven creatures guarding the doorway caught sight of them, the intruders. Their glistening chests expanded, sucking air. Their faces contracted, eyes squinting in an expression that a human would interpret as hatred or surprise. And then, their scaly warted hands whipped over their heads and brought forth swords. Selina already held her sword in her right hand and her whip in her left. She leapt forward and howled, a wordless cry that harmonized oddly with the battle roar of the orcs. And in almost the first instant of the clash, one of the orc heads separated from its body and flew through the air, trailing foul-smelling black blood. Hiru breathed evenly, trying to still his trembling. The Sword of Good gave a tiny soft growl at his side, a sound that only he could hear, as Selina slashed her blade across another orc's face, giving rise to a whistling howl. Still, he kept the sword sheathed. Do not waste yourself against mundane opponents. Even now, the wizard was eyeing him closely, as if expecting him to defy orders and plunge into battle himself. A small part of him, the part that wasn't totally terrified by the battle, was flattered that Dolph thought so highly of him. It was all Hero could do not to turn and bolt. He was tensing his legs as though exerting a constant muscular effort to keep them in the same place. The orc bodies were piling up around Selina, the whip blinding or tripping or yanking, her blade ending life. It might have taken hours or seconds before a huge blow split the last orc's head all the way down the middle. She stood there, blood spattered and panting heavily, waiting as though daring the bodies to ever move again. Then her face relaxed and she gave a light laugh and stooped to wipe her blade on the black orc leather. You're hurt, Hiru blurted suddenly. Red was soaking through the leather on Selina's left arm. Selina glanced downward. A scratch. You cannot assume that, rumbled the wizard. Their blades may be poisoned. Dolph stepped forward and brushed Selina's arm briefly with the staff. Oh. Selina said, her face surprised. It's... But Dolph was already moving past her to look at the gate the orcs had guarded and the stairway leading upward. I believe that there is a dark magus upstairs. A magus? Here? A magus, Hero echoed. He swallowed hard. He knew what that meant. Dolph only glanced at Selina. Do as I taught you. Drop your weapons, sit in the corner, and clear your mind. Now, as Selina seemed about to protest. An ordinary warrior is only a liability in a battle of wills. A weak point to be defended. 
a piece to be turned against its player. Selina looked at Hiru. Hiru nodded. And Selina sheathed her sword, dropped it and the whip, unbuckled the harness that held her daggers, and sat down in the corner of the room and began chanting softly to herself. Dolph spared her only a glance. And now, my prince, you may enter the battle. Though most of Hiru's mind was whited out by terror, there was a remnant that seemed to see and follow the pattern, like reciting memorized lines in a play. And that remnant knew that Hiru's part was to draw the Sword of Good. The ancient metal whispered out of its scabbard. As Hiru drew the sword, it began wailing a small, thin shriek that Hiru knew only he could hear. The scream seemed to come from an infinitely narrow line running straight down the center of the sword. The sound had a quality that forced away attention, as though your eye were looking too close to the sun. As though, if you listened too hard, you would... You would lose... Dolph strode around the fallen orcs and their assorted body parts. Hiru followed, breathing evenly. The sword informed his hand to grip it high and across his chest. Who are we fighting? Hiru was surprised at how neutral his voice sounded. A note of condemnation entered Dolph's voice. A false wizard this, not born to the art, nor trained in the halls. Its gifts come to it by a higher master, by necromancy and potions. But fear not, my prince. I shall prevent its will from reaching Selina and smother its other magics, and your sword will sweep aside its defenses like fallen leaves. Through the door they swept and mounted the stairs of the tower. Dolph was breathing heavier now, his face belying the effort of warding off some pressing will. Hiru felt nothing except perhaps a note of crispness in the air as the sword in his hand enforced an edict against certain specific types of delusion. Then they were standing at the highest level of the tower, the end of the stairs, before one small wooden door. I'll enter first, Dolph signed. And you follow as fast as you can, and strike as quickly as may be done. Be careful not to strike me, my prince. The sword of good may strengthen your hand, but not guide your steps. It will strike me as easily as the foe, if you happen to turn it in my direction. Hiru nodded. The air of neutrality was wearing away, and the acrid tang of adrenaline was entering his mouth. Three, signed the wizard. Two, one. Dolph's oaken staff crashed against the door, blasting it off the hinges in a flare of light, and Dolph was racing into the room, and Hiru was following him, and the figure in stained brown robes was spinning its staff forward, and a wall of flames swept out. Hiru flinched and gave a small shriek, but the flames washed over him ineffectively before his feet could even stumble, averted by the sword. Dolph also was untouched. The defenses of a wizard were nearly impossible to break, Dolph had said. Some wizards spent hours every day building them higher. There was only one known weapon that could kill a wizard in a single blow, and that was... Am I really going to do this? But the sword was already swinging forward in Hiru's hand, and the blade bounced off the air around the stained brown robes with a sudden shower of orange sparks. Crap. Hiru had time to think. And then the false wizard staff was sweeping toward him. Metal it was, not wood. But the sword in his hand moved to parry it, and there was another shower of sparks. Keep attacking! You chipped his sorcery! Keep fighting! Hiru gasped for breath and began to chop away with the sword as though cutting wood, sending bits and pieces of broken magic everywhere. There was little force in the blows, except when the sword moved to parry the staff. The rest was speed and repetition. Then, the scarred face beneath the hood gave a sudden shriek, as the sword lightly scored over the dark flesh. Is the shield down? Before Hiru could even complete the thought, his arm lashed out with sudden force, and the sword sank through the robes near where a human would keep their heart. There were no last words, not even a brief sigh. 
The false wizard's eyes widened, and then the robes just... fell over. Hiru fell to his knees. Your Highness! I'm all right. Hiru choked out. Nausea competed with adrenaline for control of his existence, and lack of oxygen, and sharp and dull pains from his over-exercised hand and arm. Dolph's staff brushed him, and the pain and nausea faded. That only made it worse. It removed the distractions. The wizard was still looking at him, eyes flickering between Hiru and the sword. Wielding the sword of good did not hurt you, did it, your highness? There was alarm in Dolph's voice, as well there might have been. The sword of good, according to Dolph, would kill the unworthy with the lightest touch, as of a single finger on the blade. It killed nine out of ten would-be wielders, and in ordinary times the imperial family was not allowed to even try. It had been prophesied that Hiru would wield the sword, and yet... Dolph, why did the sword bounce off his shields? You said it would cut through magic with a single blow. Dolph seemed uneasy. It has been centuries since the last wielder held the sword of good, noble prince. Perhaps not all the stories are true. To cut through a wizardly shield with a score of blows is still a very great power. No. Hiru hesitated. Then, I'm not wielding the sword at full strength. I can feel it. It seems disappointed in me. Dolph nodded. The sword of good, he quoted softly, contains the essence of that which empowers a hero, the truth which only heroes can face. My prince, I have been reluctant to say this, but you have not been acting heroic. There was a peculiar gentleness on Dolph's face that softened the impact of the words. But it will come with time, of that I am certain. It is written in the royal blood of your forefathers. You were raised in another place, but you are the heir of bronze. Hiru retched, then swallowed hard, and hard again. With a sudden flash of horror he knew, and he knew just how unheroic it was, that he was about to throw up on the corpse. Their horses sauntered through the streets of the city, the capital of the whole province it was, which meant perhaps a square mile enclosed by wooden walls and the occasional two-story building. Hiru kept his eyes moving, watching for possible ambushes. Not that he really thought he had a chance of spotting one, if there was one, but it was his best guess at how a hero would act. What would Aragorn do? That had been the refrain of his thoughts of late. Was the lady carrying a clay pot on each shoulder a threat? Was the legless beggar, watching them with incurious eyes, a spy? There was an excited buzz of conversation in the streets. From the snatches that were audible, Hiru gleaned that a military outpost of the Empire had been overrun by orcs. The Empire was trying to play it down, said the overheard voices, but rumor had it a major disaster for the planned invasion campaign. Hiru glanced over at Dolph and Selina. Neither seemed to be paying any particular attention to the matter. They cantered on for a short while longer, and finally Dolph drew rein. <coughs> Selina at once followed, and after a moment's reaction time, so did Hiru. Here, Dolph rumbled. Hiru looked at the building on their right. There was a huge painted board in front, showing a mouth being crammed with a turkey leg larger than itself. The sign scratched below, the translation spell informed him, meant, in of extremely tasty food. One nice thing about this world, if they don't want you to know, they just keep quiet. And if they want you to know, they tell you straight out. Hiru didn't say it out loud, though. Aragorn, descendant of Elendil and heir to the throne of Gondor, wouldn't have said it. Was that part of what empowered a hero? That solemnity? Or maybe just taking things seriously? Hiru didn't know, but there was no point in taking chances. The sword hadn't killed him yet, but neither had it fully unlocked in his hand. 
The innkeeper's eyes went wide at the sight of Dolph's staff, and they were swiftly ushered into a private side room with a basket of candied fruits already waiting. Selina had a sugared orange slice in her mouth almost as quickly as she sat down, and sighed in bliss. Even Dolph took a handful of nuts. Hiru, with a private sigh, took an apple slice lightly dusted in a spice he didn't recognize. Just the fact that it was spiced probably made it one of the most expensive and luxurious treats this world had to offer. He bit, chewed, swallowed. God, he missed chocolate. So now what? Selena said after she'd eaten half the bowl. Now we wait. For what? Dolph looked around. The staff twitched in his hand and shed a brief woody glow. Even so, the wizard lowered his voice before he spoke. This night, an assassin courier and two hired thugs will come to this very inn, their wagon having broken a wheel on the road. We must have the message that they carry, for it contains a hint to the location of the empty necklace. Selina blinked. Fine, I give up. How could you possibly know that? Dolph looked at Hiru, his eyes asking permission. Tell her, Hiru said. He tried for a note of authority in his voice, a crown prince's decision, but he didn't know if he'd succeeded. Dolph nodded, and his gaze shifted back to Selina. How much do you know about the prophecy of destiny? One nice thing about this world, they put very clear labels on everything. Oh, skip it. Selina blinked. Not much. That's wizard business. Not much call for it in the pirating profession. Very true. But what do you know? Selina shrugged. A new lord of dark shall arise over evil land, commanding the bad races, and attempt to cast the spell of infinite doom. The long-lost heir wielding the sword of good shall kick evil's ass. That's about it. That's it? Hiru said incredulously, then caught himself. Aragorn wouldn't have said that. Selina smiled at him. It was enough for me, your Imperial Highness. A chance like this only comes along once in a woman's lifetime. She blew him a kiss. For once, Hiru wasn't distracted. Master Dolph, Hiru said, trying to make it a statement instead of a question. I believe she needs to know more than that. Yes. Though it is wizard's business indeed, and only by imperial command may it go further. He drew a breath, lowered his voice further. The original prophecy of destiny, Selina, was never written down. It has been memorized by the Archmagi and passed down by word of mouth through the generations. It is more detailed than you seem to realize. You are mentioned, Pirate Princess, mentioned by name and your mother's name, Daughter of Elaine. Selina's mouth lay open, a picture of perfect astonishment. Ah, uh, do I die at the end? No one knows. The prophecy of destiny is a strange thing, Pirate Princess. It tells of some events in the smallest detail omits others that would seem very large. Told we were to be on the ship that you attacked. Told we were of your name. The prophecy of destiny carries through to the confrontation between the long-lost heir and the Lord of Dark, on the very verge of the casting of the spell of infinite doom. Then, it says... The long-lost heir shall choose between good and bad. And there, there of all places, the foretelling ends. Huh. Selina tapped her cheek. I somehow suspect, Master Wizard, that you wouldn't tell me or His Imperial Highness if I did die at the end. She stared at Dolph, and Dolph looked back neutrally. So what does the Spell of Infinite Doom do? Destroy the world? Few there are who would deliberately destroy the world. Even the Lord of Dark requires lesser beings to rule over. No, the spell of infinite doom destroys the equilibrium. Light and dark, 
summer and winter, luck and misfortune. The great balance of nature will be not upset, but annihilated utterly, and in it set in place a single will, the will of the Lord of Dark, and he shall rule not only the people, but the very fabric of the world itself until the end of days. Huh, Selina said again. Her eyes flicked to Hiru. And how are you leaning on that choice between good and bad? Good, Hiru said instantly. Even if the Lord of Dark offered you the number two position as the master of the universe? Good. You're not even thinking about it. It's not exactly a difficult question. Calling it the choice between good and bad kind of gives away the answer. Selina was trying not to smile. You've never been tempted by anything? It's not a matter of temptation. It's... He trailed off for a moment. It wasn't that he couldn't find the words, it was that the concepts didn't exist in this world. What he wanted to say was that he had a pretty good idea what sort of behavior got you listed as a villain in the great TV Tropes wiki of the universe. And he'd had a worried eye on his own character sheet since the day he'd realized what he'd gotten himself into. And he absolutely, positively wasn't going to go Dark Messiah, Knight Templar, well-intentioned extremist, or for that matter, lawful stupid. It must be that the Lord of Dark will find something to offer you. Selina's eyes were serious now. Otherwise, it won't be much of a choice between good and bad. Fine by me, Hiru said with some acerbity. It wasn't the questioning of his honor that disturbed him, so much as the idea of missing a choice that obvious. How could anyone not know what their character sheet would say about that? What if the Lord of Dark had me prisoner and threatened to kill me unless you... Good. Selina opened her mouth, then closed it again. Sudden hurt showed in her eyes. Oh, come on! Hiru was too shocked in that brief critical moment even to think of smoothing it over. Have some common sense, Selina. The whole world? Selina smiled, a strange true smile tinged with sorrow. So this is the one who can touch the sword of good. You will be a great emperor some day, your imperial highness. A very great emperor. And you will see fit to reward me with a court title, and I will be Lady Selina. A nun shall dare speak of the days when I was a pirate and an outlaw. Maybe some nights you shall have me grace your bedchamber for old time's sake, and maybe not. That is enough. More than I have a right to ask. It was a foolish thought. I... An abrupt pain caught at Hiru's heart, which might have been for the sheer unfairness. Think it through, Selina. Even if I did care about you more than anything, it would still be a stupid choice. Let the Lord of Dark complete the spell of infinite doom? You might wish you had died. I understand. Selina said, still with that strange, sad smile. Your reasoning is exactly correct, Your Imperial Highness. I am not questioning you at all. I am only observing that you do not love me. Later that night, as with soft footsteps they padded toward the room where the assassin courier and his two companions slept, Hiru held the sword in his hand and stared at the central ridge of the blade. The endless wail still arose from it, from the infinitely thin line through the center. Hiru had been getting used to the sound, over time, which made it even harder to focus his attention on it. Do I get any points for that, sword? For what I said to Selina, even though I may have lost her? The wail seemed only to diminish slightly, or maybe it was only Hiru's attention wandering away. It can't be that a hero is someone who would choose one person over the world. Not literally the world. Can it? The sound softened further, as if that infinitely thin line were growing more distant. I wouldn't be glad to sacrifice her. It would hurt. But I put myself on the line too. Isn't that what heroism is all about? Sacrificing yourself 
and your own desires for the good of the world? What is the truth that only heroes can face, if not that? Hiru stared intently at the sword, as if demanding an answer, and then became aware that his attention had moved away once again from that silent scream. And the three of them stood before the doorway. Selina took a small vial from off her harness and dripped small droplets of oil onto the hinges of the door. She was no master thief, but she had a quietly professional grasp of the basics. Quietly and slowly, the door opened. Selina went in first, and Dahl followed her, and then Hiru silently brought up the rear, sword held in guard position. The assassin courier had a thin, pointed beard, and wore a light chain shirt even in his sleep. His two escorts had an unshaven, unsavory look, and it was obvious from the smell of the room that they had not bathed. The three of them were laid out on a line on as many beds. Selina had a long, thin poniard already in her hand, and plunged that needle straight through the left eyelid of the first thug, swift as a sword strike on the downward plunge, stopping abruptly in mid-death blow lest she strike the skull on the other side and make a sound. She went around the beds and repeated the silent kill there on the other thug, as Dolph quietly moved to each of the four corners of the room in turn while Hiru blocked the exit. Then, with a knife held just above the courier's throat, she spoke in a whisper, Don't move or I'll slit your throat before you can scream. The courier's eyes flew open and he drew a sudden breath, but stayed quiet. It may or may not matter to you but you've been working for the Lord of Dark in case you didn't know. Now tell us the message that you carry. Help, thieves! cried the courier in a small, soft voice that no one could possibly hear outside the room. Dolph's gaze lay intent upon the courier's throat. You see how it is. So you can tell me the message right now, and the wizard here will know if you lie, I do assure you. Or you can tell us the message... Later, choose. Drown in a cesspool, softly yelled the courier. What frightens you? Skinning? Castration? Watching his face the while. Blinding? Crippling? Or maybe? The courier spat at her. Selina moved quickly, but the spittle still struck her on the cheek. She didn't take her blade from his throat or her other blade from his crotch. You'll regret that, she said in a voice that brought a sudden chill to Hiru's blood. Her hands whitened on the blades. Hiru suddenly had a sense of impending disaster, as if events in the room were about to spiral out of control. He opened his mouth, then closed it again. He couldn't think of a single thing to say that wouldn't interfere with the interrogation. Dolph spoke, a quieter version of his usual rumble. It seems you're failing to impress him. Dolph took a step closer and locked eyes with the courier. How's this for a threat, Dark's dog? Suddenly the color drained from the courier's face as his eyes locked onto some vision that only he and Dolph could see. The courier screamed and the sound came out as a small, thin, pathetic wail. Dolph stepped back. That's a threat he said in Selina's general direction, and smiled one of his rare grins. The city of Salantra, gasped the courier. I was to tell a man in black, who would call himself Alec, at the crossroads of Thu, to go to the city of Salantra and investigate the temple ruins. That's all I know, I swear. Selina looked inquiringly at Dolph, and Dolph nodded. They scattered a few gold coins on the floor to pay for the cleanup of the three corpses and left at once while the cover of night still held. End First Half of Sword of Good Thank you to the following people. Selena by Brooke Davis Dolph Drake Walker This chapter's original text, production notes, and attribution links along with archives and much more, can be found at hpmorpodcast.com. Some sound effects used are courtesy of the Free Sound Project. Thank you for listening, and come back in two weeks for the conclusion to The Sword of Good. (laughs) 